Wireless microphones have a different meaning for everyone. For some, it means freedom of movement and a whole new world of production possibilities. For others, it's the never-ending source of your worst nightmares. Like when the director of the local high school drama club wants to have all 20 of the principal actors on wireless lobs. And then when you ask, did you have a professional install this wireless system? They say, no, we just bought 20 of them on Amazon. Do you know how to plug them in? Run away! Run away! So yes, wireless technology is a tremendous production tool, but it can be a really big headache if you don't know what you're doing or if you're working with cheap gear. But for the sake of this discussion, let's assume that we're working with quality gear and focus on how to better use it. Now it seems obvious to say that wireless microphones are not magic, but many people who are using them, including people in our own business who should know better, treat them as if they are. And I am guilty of this myself. I have turned on wireless systems many times without scanning the RF field, and I have placed antennas in places that make no sense whatsoever. But when things go wrong, we are too quick to blame the equipment, when often the case is we're doing something wrong. So what's the right way? Well, like many things, the answer isn't as clear and straightforward as we'd like, but think of it like this. When people people want to know how to make a good recording, the answer isn't as simple as use a good microphone. That's just one piece of a much bigger puzzle. I made a whole video about that, by the way. Wireless technology is very much the same. There are many pieces of the puzzle that make radio transmission work, and wireless technology and pro audio are the convergence of two very complex topics. Now, I'm not going to be able to cover all of the intricacies of wireless technology, but what I will cover in this video is a comprehensive list of do's and don'ts but mostly don'ts. Now before I get into this, I need to mention that this video would not have been possible without the help and guidance of Carl Winkler of Electrosonics. And if you really want to dig into this, check the description for Carl's webinars on wireless technology. First, let's talk about frequency selection. A wireless system consists of two main parts, a transmitter and a receiver. The transmitter will transmit on a radio frequency with the audio signal encoded into it. The receiver will then receive that RF signal and decode the audio. Now you can have multiple receivers picking up the transmission from one transmitter, but not the other way around. You cannot have multiple transmitters trying to reach one receiver. If you do, the receiver can get confused about which signal is strongest and then it might just spit out a bunch of garbage. So you need to have all of your devices tuned to separate frequencies. Uh. Which frequencies? Well, one, they need to be in a frequency range that is legal to use. Two, you can't use a frequency that someone else is using. Duh. And three, if you have multiple wireless units, their frequencies need to be appropriately spaced apart. Now, if that already seems confusing, that's why most big productions have a wireless technician. But let's back up and look at those one at a time. Which frequency ranges are legal to use? In the United States, the FCC governs the activity of the entire RF spectrum, of which we are allowed to play in this little section right here, and we have to share that with all the television stations. So that amounts to 174 megahertz to 216 megahertz, 470 to 608 megahertz, and if you have a Part 74 FCC license, 941 to 960 megahertz. Well, I've been operating at 620 megahertz, that works fine. Yeah, but you can't anymore. There's been some changes to the laws and now that's in the forbidden zone. And it's important to keep in mind that these laws can change, so it's best to check the FCC's website for the most accurate information. You can't use a frequency that someone else is using. So how do I know if someone else is on that frequency? Well, you could just turn it on and find out accidentally on purpose, but that's not really a good strategy. What you should do is perform an RF scan with a spectrum analyzer. This isn't as scary as it sounds. There are many products that do this, and many receivers have an analyzer built in. This can tell you where the current RF activity is, and that big blob right there is a television station. You want to avoid that. Now, if you're involved with a big production that 100 other reporters are covering, there will hopefully be a wireless coordinator or showrunner who can tell you what frequencies are available. And you better do what they say because they're super serious about it. If you have multiple wireless units, their frequencies should be appropriately spaced apart. This means that you should choose frequencies that discourage interference with each other. Ideally, you want them as far apart as possible, but with microphones, you want their frequencies to be at least 400 kilohertz apart. For example, if microphone A was set to 500.5 megahertz, Mic B should either be set to 500.1 or 500.9. And if you have in-ear monitors in addition to mics, the in-ear frequencies should be at least 500 kilohertz apart and at least one megahertz away from the mic frequencies. When it comes to wireless in-ear systems and wireless microphone systems on the same stage, the further apart in frequency they are, the better. But if you've got a whole bunch of devices and channels to manage and the thought of assigning all those frequencies makes your head hurt, you might consider using frequency coordination software. Most manufacturers provide this software for free with their wireless systems. 
Now let's talk about antenna placement. Antennas are another one of those items that people tend to treat like magic wands of power, but they're definitely not magic. They're more like cats. They don't like it when other cats are in their personal bubble. So try to keep your antennas spaced apart and definitely keep your in-ear antennas a fair distance away from your microphone antennas. If you have multiple wireless units in a rack, you'll get a much better performance if you have one pair of antennas that go into an antenna splitter or distribution system rather than having them all buried in a rack with their antennas pointing in opposite directions. Wireless units have the best performance when you have a clear line of sight between the transmitter and the receiver. So getting those antennas raised up will ensure that you have a good line of sight connection. All right, I'll just extend these antennas with some coax. Well, not so fast. You also need to consider the cables you're using to connect your antennas. Using coaxial antenna cables will introduce a loss of RF gain. Now how much gain will depend on the length and the type of the cable. Let's say you want to increase your range by using 100 feet of RG58 cable to get the antennas closer to the transmitters. Seems like a logical and reasonable thing to do. However, that cable is introducing a loss of 15 dB of RF gain. So in other words, we actually made it worse. So let's try this with some RG8X cable. Well, this is better, but we still have a loss of 9 dB. So let's swap out the antennas with some active antennas that give us a 9 dB boost. Now we're in good shape. Now be careful with RF boost because you don't want to overload your receivers with RF gain. This can cause you all kinds of problems, so it's best to work up a plan and calculate all of your RF gains and losses. Ideally, you want somewhere between 0 and minus 6 dB of loss of RF gain between the antenna and the receiver. And finally, let's talk about audio gain. Wait, didn't we just talk about gain? Nope, this is audio gain, not the same thing as RF gain. Audio gain is the amount of audio signal that you're applying to the transmitter before it gets encoded into the RF signal. Setting the audio gain properly will give you a better overall signal and it will improve your range on an FM-based or analog wireless system. Carl made a great video demonstrating this. But check with the manufacturer's guidelines for how to set audio gain. Most manufacturers want you to have the audio level set so it's just bumping up against the audio limiter. Now, like I said, this video does not cover everything about wireless technology, but hopefully there's enough here to at least get you thinking about how you're using your wireless gear. Like any piece of technology, it needs to be used correctly, and getting rid of our magic wand mentality is a great place to start. About his something. Yep, I'm, this is gonna happen a lot. I forgot everything I just read. So yes, wireless technology can be a tremendous production tool, but it can be a big headache. <laughs> a headache? What's a headache? Well, like many things, the answer is train. And I am guilty of this myself. I've turned on wireless systems many times without scanning the RF field, and I have placed antennas. I've... I'm running out of breath. Damn, you had that one. Take a big breath. <laughs> And I am guilty of this myself. I have to... Ugh. Now, I'm not going to be able to cover all of the intricacies of wireless technology. Be, be, technology be? <laughs> that's, that's a new word. Technology could be. But think of it like this. <laughs> now, I'm not going to be able to cover all of the intricacies of wireless technology in this video, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not going to be... Sh Here, I want you to... Take some video of me doing this so I have a thing for my Instagram. For the grams. And if you really want to dig it and dig it, dig it. If you really dig it, then dig the description, man. Then you'll really dig it. <laughs> Hundred other reporters are covering. Hopefully there will be. Hopefully you want fries with that. No, we just bought 20 of them on Amazon. Do you know how to <laughs> Setting the audio game properly gives you a better overall signal. And that's it. Was it intelligible? Yes, definitely. Okay.